Good morning. I am the aforementioned uh, Mark Bauhaus from Juniper Networks, and I've been uh, had the privilege of being on the board of uh, Joint Venture for the last three years. And it's my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, and thank you, Wells Fargo, for your sponsorship here. Um, and it is our tradition not to give lengthy introductions, so I would uh, point you to Tim O'Reilly's background uh, in the program that you have on your table uh, for some information on Tim himself. But let me tell you a little bit about why we asked him uh, and invited him to speak this morning. Uh, Tim is a pillar of Silicon Valley. Uh, he is an innovator and a visionary around technology. Uh, he was an early articulator of Web, web 2.0. Uh, he has been a uh, visionary around open technology collaboration, around new platforms for education using technology, and around open government. He's a venture capitalist, he's a publisher, he's a convener of conferences, uh, and he is a deep thinker. Uh, Tim uh, is uh, well known in, in the uh, Valley for all those things, and he's the ideal segue as we think about the last conversation around government and regionalism, and now bring in technology to the conversation. Uh, his message of collaboration and cooperation uh, is exactly the kind of uh, partnership spirit that we have in joint venture and that we need going forward. Uh, so with that, uh, ladies, and, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Tim O'Reilly. Thank you for having me. It's kind of nice uh, sponsorship because Wells Fargo is, in fact, O'Reilly Media's bank. Uh, so let's, let's get started. Uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about the future of cooperation. Now, I'd like to start with a quote from Edwin Schlossberg. He said, the skill of writing is to create a context in which other people can think. And that's a lot of what I do. I'm going to talk about things that may at first seem familiar. And I'm going to hopefully allow you to see the connections between them and get you to think uh, freshly about them. So today I've taken as my topic cooperation, and in particular the way that technology is changing the nature of cooperation. But I want to go back to the beginning. Uh, you know, we can look at social structure among uh, the great apes as uh, maybe a proxy for the very earliest human forms of cooperation. I picked this up out of Wikipedia, uh, gorillas. The silverback is the center of the troop's attention, making all the decisions, mediating conflicts, determining the movements of the group, leading the others to feeding sites, and taking responsibility for the safety and well-being of the troop. We still see human societies that are organized like that. Uh, chimpanzees, a little more complex. The dominant male does not always have to be the largest and strongest, but rather the most manipulative and political, who can influence the goings on within a group. Male chimpanzees typically attain dominance through cultivating allies who will provide support for that individual in case of future ambitions for power. Sounds a lot like Congress. Uh, Jared Diamond, in his book Guns, Germs, and Seal, talked about the evolution of complex societies as driven really by the economics of food production. And he traces four stages, band, tribe, chiefdom, and today our modern uh, state uh, nation-state kind of model. Uh, I think we're going to go beyond this, and I want to talk a little bit about that. One of the big ways that the state has evolved is its partnership with something that we call the market. Now, Adam Smith uh, famously referred to the invisible hand, and he talked a lot about self-interest rather than cooperation driving the market. The magic of market cooperation was actually driven by people following their uh, individual self-interest said, it's not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard for their own interest. We address ourselves not to their humanity, but to their self-love, and never talk to them of our own necessities, but of their advantages. Now, this kind of free market fundamentalism is a big strain in Silicon Valley, and yet you have to understand that there is this magical other side, that through the free market we also do experience a kind of cooperation. But what comes next as the internet weaves us all into a single global brain? Now that is a, a map, a routing map of the internet, and it's remarkable how similar it looks to the new kinds of maps that they're starting to be able to build of the neuronal structure of 
uh, brain. At the moment, they were just working on the mouse brain, and it's still more complicated than the internet. Uh, but we're, uh, con we're, mo we're continuing to move forward, and a lot of interesting things are happening. Now, when I talk about the future, I like to remind people that what I'm really doing is focusing them on the present. Science fiction writer William Gibson once said, the future is here, it's just not evenly distributed yet. And many of the times when I have been, you know, celebrated for having predicted something, I just talked about what I was seeing around me and just made projections about where it was going to go. And that's really what I'm going to do today. Now, so let's start with the current state of our modern economy. Uh, Bill Janeway, uh, in his recent book, Doing Capitalism in the Innovation Economy, uh, makes a really important point. He says, I've come to read the history of the innovation economy as driven by three sets of continuous reciprocal interdependent games played between the state, the market economy, and financial capitalism. Now, Bill is a famous, very successful uh, venture capitalist. He the, was the guy who funded uh, BEA, great Silicon Valley success story, Nuance, a number of other companies, Veritas. Uh, but uh, he makes this really, really interesting point in the book that the market, as we normally understand it, the market uh, of people trading goods and services is not the same as financial capital. And that we saw, for example, in the 2008 market crash, just how the interests of financial capital can diverge from the interests of both the state and the market. And that's why Bill refers to it as a three-player game. And um, I think we need to look at the evolution of all three of those things. Uh, I'm not going to talk a lot about financial markets, uh, both because it's not an area in which I have huge expertise, uh, but I would urge you to look at that field because financial markets are network markets even more than the internet. And we're seeing all kinds of phenomena there uh, for everything from uh, the speed uh, of uh, the automation of trading to um, you know, the way people are trying to hide data. There's all kinds of really interesting uh, material there. New York is the other Silicon Valley that we should be paying attention to. Uh, but I want to uh, talk a little bit about the state. Uh, Bill Janeway defines the state, uh, and this is very much aligned with Jared Diamond's idea of the state as a kind of kleptocracy. Uh, Bill says, this, by the state, I mean the political entity that has sufficient coercive power to establish the rules for the other players. Now, uh, you can see that in a monument like the pyramids. You know, they are able to compel the entire power of their society to build these massive monuments to the leaders. That's the kleptocracy element. Um, but what's kind of interesting today, we already see ways in which uh, companies in Silicon Valley are starting to be treated as if they were states. You see headlines that put uh, you know, our companies and nation states on the same you know, page. You know, we talk about the power of Twitter and Facebook in Egypt, Google blocked in China. You know, companies have foreign policy with respect to nation states. So we're starting to mix up uh, this distinction, and that's worth keeping in mind. And I wrote a blog post recently uh, about the way that you could consider the, you know, the current troubles of the euro as a kind of cyber warfare between financial markets and the financial sector and nation states, you know, where basically the financial markets are saying we can profit from uh, damaging these currencies. You know, George Soros did that originally when he broke the pound. Uh, but this, think about that as a cyber war, and it gives you a very different perspective on how our institutions are evolving. But I want to focus mainly in this talk, at least in this central section of the talk, on fundamental changes in cooperation. And a Bill Prize winning economist, Ronald Coase, in 1937, wrote a very important paper called The Nature of the Firm. And in The Nature of the Firm, he talked about why was it that Adam Smith's invisible hand did not produce a world in which everyone worked for themselves. And he had a theory that uh, the firm was a way of reducing transaction costs, of aggregating demand, of aggregating workers, uh, various kinds of things that became the foundation over the last couple hundred years of modern uh, capitalism. 
Uh, in 2001, Yokai Bankler wrote a paper called Coase's Penguin, or Linux and the Nature of the Firm. And in the abstract, he wrote, I expand consideration of the policy implications of the apparent success of free software in two ways. First, I suggest that the phenomenon has broad implications throughout the information, knowledge, and culture economy, well beyond software development. Second, I suggest reasons to think that peer production may outperform market-based production in some information production activities. So the nature of the firm was going to change, Banco said, and he saw software development and open source software in particular as an early sign of that. Uh, and sure enough, uh, Linux uh, was a great demonstration. Uh, Eric Raymond once said, uh, given enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow in his book, The Cathedral and the Bazaar. Uh, Wikipedia, obviously, an incredible product of peer production. You know, we have an event like the earthquake in Japan uh, in 2011. That first Wikipedia entry uh, written in, you know, clearly by somebody in Japan because the English is, is a little fractured. It says, an earthquake occurred on 30 kilometers east of Sendai, Honshu, Japan. The earthquake possible to create regional tsunami on the zone. Now, uh, you know, within a matter of weeks, the entry looked like this you know, a complete detailed summary of all the details, comprehensive, through the work of 1,500 odd people making, you know, 5,000 edits. I actually uh, had an animation of this which didn't translate from my uh, uh, Mac uh, to the PC that they're using backstage, but uh, you, you get the idea. Um, you know, it, it's, it's quite amazing to watch this new form of coordination and collaboration through technology you know, as it happens. Um, but this peer production is also hitting the entertainment economy. I have a three-year-old grandson, and uh, through uh, working, spending time with him, I discovered a genre of YouTube video, which are Thomas the Tank Engine train crash videos. This one has 24 million video, uh, 24 million views. This is peer production at work. He can watch a Disney cartoon or he can watch a video produced by a five-year-old and his dad. And uh, I think YouTube is actually about to break out. You know, we kind of don't think of it because it's sort of part of Google and we don't see its numbers, but it's huge. I was just recently down at a conference called VidCon down in LA and it felt like being at the Beatles in 1964 as YouTube star after YouTube star came out on stage to the screams, uh, you know, there were thousands of screaming girls in the audience for people I'd never heard of. Uh, there's something really interesting happening there. Um, and of course, Google itself is an example of peer production. We all put our pages on the web, Google, uh, brings them together for us. Uh, they harness our, you know, our clicks uh, to sell to advertisers. Uh, it's a new kind of peer production. And of course, Facebook. You know, the users of Facebook are the product that Facebook has to offer. And, and even Apple's product is co-created by the market of its users. You know, I've got a picture there of that first generation iPhone. Uh, you know, it's got a baker's dozen of apps. And now there are over 800,000. 800, What's even more important, and this is really important to remember in the context when people start talking about hackers, Apple didn't have an app store in the original iPhone. They added it after people were jailbreaking the iPhone to add apps. And Apple wisely realized that this was uh, something that they wanted to get behind rather than that they wanted to shut down. Similar way Google did this with Google Maps, the first Google Maps mashups were done when people quote, illegally decoded the format. And rather than trying to stop it, Google rode that uh, uh, developer in interest uh, to, to dominance. And of course, we see this peer production economy now becoming more formalized with uh, a nice way of money changing hands with uh, crowdfunding startups like Kickstarter. You know, here's something I want to do. Will you give me money? It's just this very pure market. It's a very, very interesting new uh, twist on this uh, crowdsourcing. Now, will this lead us to what Cory Doctorow in his first book called uh, uh, The Adhocracy, you know, in which uh, everything is just uh, on the fly, um, you know, by the moment? You know, we have this possibility uh, where somebody can come out of nowhere and become a star on YouTube. Uh, we have this magical process by which something happens and a Wikipedia entry 
appears. Is it all ad hoc? I'm not sure because there's a way, this goes back to this notion that uh, companies are becoming more state-like and there are people who aggregate all this user uh, intelligence, this new kind of market. And we see these headlines like Twitter, Twitter drops the ecosystem hammer. Don't try to compete with us. Apple is censoring. Uh, you know, Facebook's new terms of service. We can do anything we want. Instagram terms of service change sparks revolt. This is the language of politics. You know, how interesting is it that we're starting to see this sort of mixing up of the notion of this, you know, massive uh, new forms of electronic collaboration with old models of companies, uh, but also of companies starting to act as if they are themselves nations. And remember what Bill Janeway said about the state, the political entity that has sufficient coercive power to establish the rules for the other players. So here, Apple, Google, uh, Facebook, Twitter, have enough market power that they have built an entire ecosystem that they can dictate the rules to. Uh, it's kind of interesting because uh, the last uh, version of the Web2 Summit that John Battelle and I did, we used uh, the idea of, of uh, nations as an organizing principle. And it's kind of interesting because we're starting to see headlines, again, th that suggest that Facebook is a country. But there's another element of this cooperation which is perhaps even more interesting. And I'm going to start with a wonderful comment from Danny Hillis, which was relayed by Jeff Bezos at one of our conferences back in uh, 2004. He said, global consciousness is that thing responsible for deciding that pots containing decaffeinated coffee should be orange. Now think about it for a minute. How did Sanka's brand color become, you know, a fairly common symbol for decaffeinated coffee? Somehow that knowledge spread from mind to mind. Now that's been happening since the dawn of time. You know, speech, writing, uh, the printed word, mass media, and now the internet are a continuum. But what's really changed is how fast it happens. But the market itself is, the, is an example of this kind of collective intelligence. There's a wonderful uh, article written back in 1958 by a guy named Leonard Reed called I Pencil. It uh, is designed, it's really the autobiography of a pencil. And it starts with the statement that says, simple, yet not a single person on the face of this earth knows how to make me. You know, uh, there's no one person who knows how you get the wood, how you get the graphite, how you put all those pieces together. It's this magical collaboration. And this is an argument in defense of free market economics. Um, but this is what's happening here with Twitter. No one person knows what is going to come together here. And, you know, we had the Super Bowl last week, and uh, I didn't capture the moment, uh, you know, when San Francisco lost. It was probably uh, a little bit like Obi Wan Kenobi's line in, in Star Wars, where he said, uh, uh, you know, I feel a great disturbance in the force, as if a million, millions of voices were crying out at once, <laughs> you know. But we still see, even when I took this uh, uh, screenshot the other day, you know, the, 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 the echoes of this collective brain, uh, you know, reacting to the brand ads, for example. So we are starting to see something new in terms of the speed with which it's happening and the scale with which it's happening. New memes spread around the world, world very, very quickly. Now, there's one aspect of this which is summed up uh, in what's called Joy's Law. Bill, Law. Bill Joy, one of the co-founders of Sun Microsystems, once said, no matter who you are, most of the smart people work for someone else. You know, um, there's actually a point later in this talk where I was looking for a reference and I couldn't remember where I'd seen this particular piece of research. I put it out on Twitter. Uh, within a couple of minutes, uh, you know, I had a few dozen references to the URL for the paper I was trying to remember. Uh, so, Michael Nielsen, in a book called Reinventing Discovery, calls this uh, distributed micro-expertise. And he talks, in, in particular, in a very uh, wonderful chapter about a chess game which Garry Kasparov called the greatest game in the history of chess. Now, this is before his game with Deep Blue. I don't know if he still believes that it, it was the greatest game. Um, but this was a game in which, uh, it was organized by Microsoft, uh, Kasparov played against thousands of players uh, coordinated online. And in particular, there was a woman uh, named Irina Krush, who was an American uh, uh, grandmaster, but nowhere near as good as Kasparov. But 
she had studied one particular move that came up in this game. And she was able to persuade the distributed team of players to let her play it. And uh, as Michael Nielsen says, although she was inferior to Kasparov in nearly all areas of chess, in this particular area of micro expertise, she surpassed even him. This particular gambit had never been played in this you know, sequence of games, but she'd studied it and thought about the implications, and it gave him a huge amount of trouble. I think he did eventually win, but it was a tremendous game. Now, there's a lot of lessons in this story. There had been a previous similar game called Karpov versus the world, which was played in 24 hours, speed chess, and Karpov handily beat the world. This game took about six months. There was time for deliberation. There was time for discussion and voting. So there was a, kind, a new kind of, of network collaboration behind this, uh, well worth studying. Uh, Nielsen's book is a great textbook on uh, how all this stuff is unfolding. Uh, companies are trying to harness this now. We have you know, companies like Innocentive and Kaggle, which are trying to find that distributed micro expertise through competitions and the like. Uh, very, very powerful notion. But there's an even more powerful notion, which is really just collective intelligence. You know, Amazon, among many other things, uh, was way better than their competitors at harnessing collective intelligence in the form of customer reviews. They feature products not based on, you know, as Barnes & Noble did in the early days of getting online, Barnes & Noble would basically feature what publishers wanted them to and would give them money to put on the front page. And Amazon was like, no, no, we're going to put up as the top product the one that people are looking for. You know, people underestimate just how important that was. You know, that they rode that collective intelligence to offer what, you, what they wanted. They have you know, thousands of reviews telling us uh, what people think of the products. And I have a friend who won't go to any movie that has a Rotten Tomatoes score under 80. Maybe it's 85, you know? Because the fact is, there is collective intelligence that tells us what's good and what isn't. And when you go to an old-fashioned review site like consumerreports.org, because you have to, because, you know, it's a product that's not typically sold and reviewed online, you realize just how far we've come in applied collective intelligence. You know, I'm trying to buy a new kitchen range and you just can't get good reviews. But there are some dangers here. This is the paper I mentioned earlier that I was looking for by Matthew Salganik and Duncan Watts. It's basically an experimental study of self-fulfilling prophecies in music. They divided the world, uh, basically they did a lot of random sampling of music users. They created them into different worlds where they had advanced knowledge of what other people thought or no knowledge of what other people thought and completely different music became popular based on these self-fulfilling prophecies. Once you heard that somebody else liked something, you tended to follow down that world, and, uh, and so you, you ended up with five or six different top hits. Uh, he said, individuals influence each other's decisions about cultural products, but to what extent can the perception of success become a self-fulfilling prophecy? Uh, we've explored this question experimentally by art artificially inverting the true popularity of songs in the online music uh, market. We found that most songs experienced self-fulfilling prophecies in which perceived but initially false popularity became real over time. So that's a bit of a risk. Uh, and uh, George Soros, who's really one of the people who's pushed the envelope furthest on the financial capitalism side but also thinks a lot about open society, uh, has this notion of reflexivity. He says social theories are reflexive. They're a different kind of knowledge than, other kind, than, say, scientific theories. Heisenberg's discovery of the uncertainty principle did not alter the behavior of quantum particles in one iota. But social theories, whether Marxism, market fund fundamentalism, or the theory of re reflexivity, can affect the subject matter to which it refers. What we believe tends to become true. And that's a really, really important element uh, in the way the Internet is changing the dynamics of our society. And it turns out, uh, I was just reading George Dyson's wonderful book, uh, Turing's Cathedral, about the work uh, of John von Neumann and his colleagues at the Institute for Advanced Study uh, on the early uh, computing, building the architecture that really all of our computers use today. And uh, von Neumann eventually became very interested in the connection between the computer and the brain and the differences between the digital world and the analog world. And he made the very prescient observation that the message system used in the nervous system is essentially statistical. And he wondered how that would apply 
uh, to computers. And we're seeing that today. And uh, he, uh, he used the term pulse frequency coding. And George Dyson, the author of that book, uh, writes, in a pulse frequency coded system, meaning is conveyed by the frequency at which pulses are transmitted between given locations, whether those locations are synapses within a brain or addresses on the World Wide Web. Information is being encoded and operated upon as continuous and noise tolerant variables such as frequencies of connection or occurrence and the topology of what connects where, with location increasingly being defined by a fault tolerant template rather than by an unforgiving numerical address. Pulse frequency coding for the internet is one way to describe the working architecture of a search engine and page rank for neurons is one way to describe the working architecture of the brain. Uh, really, really interesting thought. We are starting to fuse computers and humans in interesting new ways through this process of collective intelligence. The statistical overlay on this digital world of human activity being correlated, collected, and turned into products which create feedback loops. So that's really one of the things I want you to take away. The invisible hand of the market, as amplified by the internet, is turning into a kind of global brain. It's just a metaphor, but it's one that's extremely suggestive and worth thinking about. Now, it's really worth also thinking about, in terms of how this is changing, uh, that we're starting to connect more and more things to the internet. Uh, GE has an event called Minds Plus Machines uh, that I was at uh, a few months ago, Jeff Immelt uh, talking about uh, how jet engines are now putting out a terabyte of data a day, uh, all kinds of industrial devices. Uh, they're, they're talking about the idea of we're building an industrial internet. Some of this is actually collective intelligence from our devices. Uh, Ford is talking about, you know, we know exactly where the rain is falling uh, when we have millions of cars whose windshield wipers are turning on and reporting that fact. Uh, we're increasingly building a world that's instrumented with sensors that we're carrying around in our pockets in the form of our cell phones. Uh, we're going to see more and more uh, information feeding this global brain, more pattern recognition happening. It's going to change our society as well. So I jump past forward. Uh, here's an example of what you can do. Uh, this is in a Fleet Owner magazine. Uh, a headline saying trucks waste 27 billion dollars annually due to congestion and you start thinking about smart roads uh, you start thinking about could we through computer control reduce that congestion I think we can huge opportunity that's really one of the industrial internet promises uh, Jeff Immelt asks if we could reduce the fuel consumption of jet engines by 1%, that would save airlines $3 billion a year. They're running a data competition uh, to try to figure out if it's possible to do that by open sourcing the data. Now, the Google Autonomous Vehicle, in one sense, is about that promise. Wow, what if we had computer-controlled cars? We could actually get way more on the roads. We could reduce congestion. We could do all kinds of interesting things. You know, why would we build high-speed rail if, in fact, all the cars could be independently coordinated? Maybe. All these are examples of something that I think has been foreseen very early in the development of the computer industry. JCR Licklider, who incidentally was the DARPA program manager uh, who funded TCPIP and much of the internet, wrote a paper in 1960 called Man-Computer Symbiosis. I've updated that to the more correct human-computer symbiosis uh, because I think there are more women involved than men. Um, but he wrote, the hope is that in not too many years, human brains and computing machines will be coupled together very tightly. And the resulting partnership will think as no human brain has ever thought and process data in a way not approached by the information handling machines we know today. We're seeing that. You know, Google is a kind of fusion of man and machine. But in an interesting way, so is that Google autonomous vehicle. You see, 2005, DARPA issued the grand challenge. And what most people have already forgotten is that the winning vehicle went seven miles in seven hours. Yet in 2011, Google told us that they had driven hundreds of thousands of miles in ordinary traffic. What was the difference? Peter Norvig uh, from Google said, we don't have better algorithms, we just have more data. It's not just better AI. 
It's actually, let's Google Street View vehicles. Those Google automated vehicles are remembering what humans did before. Every road in the US has been driven by a human equipped with sensors that are not just photographing, but measuring, noticing everything in detail. As Peter said to me, it's a hard AI problem to pick a traffic light out of a field of view of a camera. It's a trivial AI problem to know if it's red or green when you already know that it's there. Right? So there's a whole lot of interesting background here to think about of how we're fusing man and machine in new ways. And all of you who are in the technology business need to think, how are you harnessing this new kind of human-machine symbiosis in your business? Because there are a lot of creative ways to do it. Uh, take, an, uh, take Uber as an example. This is actually a human-machine symbiosis. How does this happen? You know, you have your phone, the driver has a phone, your car, the car shows up. The driver is part of the application. You are part of the application. It's really connecting you into a system of software above the level of a single device, but the human as the interface. Uh, your, your, your car shows up because uh, of a new kind of coordination and cooperation. And we see this in all the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, uh, sharing services that are starting to touch the physical world. You also see this softer above the level of a single device uh, metaphor in Square. You know, how many of you have actually gone in and bought coffee in a Square-equipped coffee shop with your Square app on your phone? You walk up and your face is on the register and they say, hi, Tim. And if you go there frequently, they'll say, you know, they'll say, do you want your usual? Because again, we've created this machine-mediated global brain, which is, again, starting to transform, to leap off the screen and transform the structure of our society, the structure of business processes. Uh, the Apple Store. You know, how many of you have been in a typical retail store and wandered around looking for a clerk? You know, you can't find one. How many of you have gone to an Apple Store? And, you know, have you had trouble finding a clerk? You know, there's, there's sort of technology-enabled super clerks. They're kind of like phone-equipped cyborgs. You know, they have access to the inventory system. They have access to the cash register right there. You know, they hand you your product, they check you out on the spot, and you walk out the door. So there's a really interesting thing here in terms of job creation. I was talking with Todd Park, who's now the federal CTO, and he sees this as the future of home health care, for example. And all kinds of, uh, Walgreens is already experimenting with this same kind of model for pharmacist assistance, you know, where they will be connected to the global brain and be able to give you better service because, in fact, you know, they are part of the system. They're part of the interface. And, of course, when you put that together with technology like Google Glasses, you can start to see how access to the global brain will actually be part of our everyday interactions. You know, it's not just going to be people out there kind of doing this uh, uh, for fun. Uh, you know, Google's done, certainly done some amazing things with, you know, you can follow somebody jumping out of a plane, great. But it's really much more that notion of, you know, how does a human become the interface to a business process when they have access to the information they need uh, on the spot? But I want to uh, turn here at the end of this talk to the state because it's an important part of the economy, uh, not just uh, it's the you know, largest buyer of IT, uh, in particular, which is an important product of, of Silicon Valley, but it's really a key. You know, Bill Janeway talked about it in terms of its ability to compel the other parties. But there's another vision of the state, which I love, which is expressed by Abraham Lincoln. He said, the legitimate object of government is to do for the people what needs to be done, but which they cannot, by individual effort, do it all or do so well by themselves. You know, market failure does happen. And it's so important for those of us in this industry to remember what a debt we owe to the government. Again, going back to George Dyson's book, you know, the whole structure of modern computing, not just the internet, but the whole structure of modern computing, you know, was funded by the government. It was wartime. And what was really amazing was that the decision was made to put it into the public domain. You know, but the modern digital computer, stored program computer, was not developed by private industry. It was developed on government contract. Okay, GPS, weather, there's all kinds of other examples which I'm going to give you. Let's give government its due. It does things that are hard, that are collective. It's a mechanism for collective action. So a lot of people, when I, they think about government and the future of 
collective action, we'll look at uh, sites like the White House petition site, We the People. Yes, it's great. People can suggest petitions uh, that they want to have responded on by the White House. Uh, you can look at sites like Popvox, in which I'm an investor, which is designed to give people input and visibility into what's happening with various bills. Uh, there's this fabulous project that came out done by Daryl Issa uh, called Madison, uh, which is a, an open source project which allows uh, bills to be put online. And, and his open act, which was in, a, uh, in response to SOPA, uh, was actually uh, crowdsourced, and they had comments that were made by the public that got into the final legislation. And uh, he's now set up a, a separate foundation to keep this out, and they're trying to apply it for more bills. There's a lot of really interesting stuff happening there. But Jen Polka, the founder of Code for America, uh, asked in her TED Talk, do we want to just be a crowd of voices, or do we want to be a crowd of hands? You know, politics is only a small part of what government does for us. And, and this notion that um, we, we just have to give them more input is, is part of what I call vending machine government. You know, the notion that we put in taxes and uh, get out services and our input, apart from our taxes, is to shake the vending machine when it doesn't give us what we want, <laughs> right? We've got to get beyond uh, the notion that our relation to government is shaking the vending machine. Uh, and I believe that there are lessons from technology. It's the idea to think about government as a platform. Government shouldn't be designing complete closed applications. Just like Apple or Google or Microsoft, it should provide fundamental services on which we, the people, build applications. Now, this applies beyond technology. Consider the highway system. This is government acting as a platform provider. Government sets the rules of the road. Uh, they uh, built the system. But it's very internet-like. It does not, in fact, specify uh, where the cars go. It followed where people, uh, in that wonderfully natural crowdsourcing of, uh, that we call the city, had decided to aggregate. Uh, it allowed commerce to explode. It tied this country into a new kind of, uh, uh, of nation, that highway system. Uh, and it, Eisenhower uh, really thought of government as a platform for society. I also point out, for those who like to rag on government, it's a little bit of a reflexive uh, knowledge kind of thing, George Soros, like uh, we create bad government by insisting that government is bad. And I want to remind you that government does so many things for us that we take for granted. Uh, Mike Lukides uh, tweeted this just the other day. He said, anyone who wonders why the USPS loses money ought to look at what private enterprise charges to deliver a letter. You know, the fact is, you get this enormous uh, benefit uh, from government. And, and so I just want to remind you that it's a very powerful tool of collective action. But it's also in the role of government providing data as a platform, we have entire industries that were created by government. Weather, where does all that weather data that appears in Google come from? It comes from government satellites, the National Weather Service, the, uh, NOAA, and uh, there's a famous uh, remark from a congressman. He said, why do we need NOAA when we have the Weather Channel? <laughs> you know, and you go, where do you think they get their data? You know, <laughs> and uh, so, uh, you know, similar kind of thing, GPS. This, all these applications, the government didn't build Foursquare or Uber or Yelp or Google Maps or that Google self-driving vehicle, but they did something really hard. They started back in 1973 to build this satellite system that would allow precise positioning. And then they decided to open it up to the public. And that's the critical platform act. That could have been kept as a military uh, asset. Instead, it was made an asset for the public in the same way that that computing uh, resource that was developed to build the atomic bomb was turned over to the public. And so we have to remember that. Acting as a platform means opening up a platform. Um, and an interesting thing, I didn't come down by, by uh, train, but when you look at uh, Caltrain, you know, and you look at Google Maps and you want to get the schedule, that all started in the city of Portland. They approached Google and said, if we published our transit schedules in a standard format, would you do that? Would you use it? 
And Google said yes. We recently, through Code for America, worked on a project with a number of cities uh, to have Yelp adopt restaurant inspection data as part of their uh, offering. So there's a really interesting thing that's starting to happen with, uh, with data. Uh, cities are also getting ahead of the curve in terms of instrumenting the world. SF Park is working on a smart parking meter system that will allow you to do congestion pricing of parking meters. Um, but there's still a challenge, and it's summed up in Moore's Law. Here's the original Moore's Law graph. Clay Johnson talks about this. He says, because of slow government procurement processes, government is always a step behind. And as Moore's Law accelerates, you can see how that can drive government more and more behind. And that's why uh, I've been involved with an organization called Code for America, which works with uh, cities. Every year, we, we recruit talented technologists, uh, and we recruit interested cities who want to be innovative. Uh, we worked last year with the city of Santa Cruz. I think Peter Cote is here in the audience. And uh, this year, we're working with three Bay Area cities, uh, San Francisco, Oakland, and actually San Mateo County uh, on different projects. Uh, we're recruiting new cities now for 2014, and we're recruiting technologists for 2014. So spread the word. It's also a program inspired partly by Code for America called the Presidential Innovation Fellows, which is trying to do the same thing at the federal level. They're also looking for fellows right now. And we also uh, had a, an accelerator program at Code for America, and, and Ron Buganam and I, who ran the Code for America Accelerator, are actually raising a GovTech fund to actually invest in civic startups. Uh, there's a project from... Uh, the Presidential Innovation Fellow is called RFPEZ, which you should all be aware of. If you have small businesses uh, who want to have a piece of that $192 billion uh, federal IT spend, uh, RFPEZ is designed to let you compete for projects. Right now, there are people who, who, who think in Washington think that a website costs uh, you know, a million dollars to build. And in fact, you know, that's because it costs a million dollars if you go through all the procurement rules. But now that it only costs you know, tens of thousands of dollars, uh, there are all kinds of new companies who can compete. So uh, we're working to build out the number of projects. We're also working uh, with Oakland this next year to actually implement RFPZ at the local level. There's another aspect. Uh, Jen uh, Polka, again, channeling 2011 Coach America fellow Scott Silverman, said, what if interfaces to government could be simple, beautiful, and easy to use? Uh, they did a project last year in Honolulu where they were trying to crowdsource the data to figure out what do people actually want from a government website. They found out people, they looked at the visitor logs and what pages they were going to, and they started to organize the website around what people were looking for rather than the way the government wanted to present itself. It totally transforms the experience. And then they got the citizens uh, to write the answers. They had a write-a-thon uh, rather than a code-a-thon. Uh, this year, we're doing a project in New York using big data, New York and Louisville, Kentucky, around some ideas from a woman named Ann Milgram, former uh, Attorney General of New Jersey, working on money balling cr criminal justice, trying to figure out which people you can let out on jail, let, let out on bail, um, using predictive analytics. So all kinds of really interesting stuff. So the reason I'm doing all this and the reason I urge all of you to think about government and not just the private sector as a focus for your work and a focus on this idea of the, the future of collaboration is to remember that government of the people, by the people, and for the people still means something. So uh, I urge you to uh, look into both the Presidential Innovation Fellows and Code for America. All right, thank you. Thank you. Terrific. Oh, one last shout out. There's two people from Code for America here over at table 73. Tim O'Reilly, thank you for bringing your facile mind to our proceeding. Thank you.